Hello, my name is Rick Houston, and welcome to the Scene Vault Podcast, your source for all things NASCAR history. Presented by Las Vegas Motor Speedway, America's racing showplace. They knew what we were. Um, did they embrace it every time? No, they didn't, but they kind of respected what we did uh, because it was good for the sport. What's the secret? The secret sauce, right? Yeah, it's like the KFC. It's yeah, hidden yeah, in the vault, yeah. Right? What's what's the hidden what's the hidden ingredient? I think there's a lot of ingredients there. I think um, number one, we're entertainment. How do you plan to spend your summer? Bum and gray. <laughs> the day NASCAR and all of us associated in any way with NASCAR forget its past, that's the day we don't have any future. All right, so. You just touched on it, your leadership style, kind of go Vinnick Gray. Um, a lot of people wouldn't react the way that you seem to have reacted. They, they would fight fire with fire. And you say, my shoulders are big enough, lay it on me. Uh, you've always seemed to have a low-key style. Why is that? Is that just your personality? I think it's my personality, and and I I I um I've never raced cars, couldn't afford to race cars, but I've raced motorcycles, and you know when you do that that racing mentality, you you have that passion, you put into it, and things don't go your way, um, because you do everything right, and something goes wrong, and you can't figure out why, so you just need to vent, and I kind of understand that point from that point, but you know the the guys are um, they're just looking somebody to talk to. You know, explain why or try not to explain why. And I get that. I get it. And so when they come up and they're mad and they're furious and, and you know, they scream at me and holler at me and cuss at me, you know, when it's done, I say, I still love you, brother. See you next week. And they says, I ain't never coming back. And as they go out the gate, they say, we'll see you next week. <laughs> so it's, you know, it, you, it's the compassion you feel for them. You really, really do. When you see a guy tear his car up, he worked all week and just tore up and he has nothing, you know, I understand that. So just, you know, talk to me, you know, communication is important. I think that's the most important thing. Don't run from it because you run from it. It's just going to boil up and be worse next time. Get it on the table and let's talk about it. All right. So today we see short tracks all across the country shutting down. Um, left and right, right, and yet Bowman Gray plays to pack grandstands basically every Saturday night, right. What's the secret? The secret sauce, right? Yeah, it's like the KFC. It's yeah, the hidden yeah, thought, yeah. Right? What's what's the hidden what's the hidden ingredient? I think there's a lot of ingredients there. I think um, number one, we're entertainment you got to realize your entertainment this happens to be racing. Um, people come to see an exciting show. Uh, controversial? Yeah, we're controversial. Um, we try to make the show, you watch a soap opera on TV. They have cliffhanger Fridays, right? You know, what happened? Last minute, what happened? you got to go back Monday to see what happens. And, and running a race and entertainment is kind of like or orchestrating the event that you, you know, you start out, pretty exciting then you get through the middle then you're building that whole time building up to the grand finale and that's what we try to do is make it exciting so when people walk away they're shaking their heads said can you believe what we just saw they've got to come back next week and see how it works now if you come in and you start you know ruling the mighty fist and this type of stuff you take the entertainment value out of it entertainment's number one number two uh today we're an instant society you know, everybody wants instant results. If you won't know something, you look it up on your phone. You call Mr. Google and get it. We run a quick, crisp show, in and out, two and a half hours, try to be. People get home in time to go to church the next day. If you look, the um, California movie people, everybody in the world has figured out the attention span's two and a half hours. That's why movies are two and a half hours. We try to contain our show in that time period. Baseball now is trying to figure out how to shorten their show because it's so long. Football shortening, you know, they're, they're keeping those clocks running to narrow it down because the society has changed. We get that. Cars on the track, race, get off, next one on, next one on. Keep things moving. I think that's another thing that works. And we run a short season. We run a very short season. Uh, we run 17 or 18 weeks. Drivers can go broken that amount of time. So, and I mean, you know, you see some tracks that run 30 races a year. 
and it gets to the point where if fans think, well, if, if I don't go this week, they're running 30 times, there's another chance I'll get to go see them. But Bowman Gray, you miss a week, you're out of the loop. I mean, could we run such a short year? I think that helps us. We don't race on the 4th of July. We just say, time out. Everybody, let's just stop. Time out. Family's going on vacation. Spend some family time. Y'all go do some family time, regroup, charge the batteries, and we'll come back and race in two weeks. I think that helps because that keeps mama happy. And if mama's happy, you know how that works. <laughs> Everybody's happy. So there's just a lot of little things we do that are not ordinary for a weekly track. And it works, so why mess with it? So. All right, so the nickname the madhouse yeah that's well deserved okay outwardly as an official you couldn't exactly encourage that kind of behavior but at the same time it puts a lot of butts in the seats it does i think the madhouse started back with the myers brothers i think when the myers brothers got out you know and said man after a night this place is a madhouse and the names just kind of stuck you know moving forward We don't encourage um, antics or anything. I think what we do is we put you in a position that you have to make a decision that may not be the best. Uh, we, I mean, now they have the choo- choose rule or the cone. We've been doing that for ever. We came up, we started doing that 30 years ago. And we redraw the different positions. We redraw the races. I'm not going to tell you what you have to do but I'm going to put you in a position you've got to make a decision on what you're going to do. And that puts you in an uncomfortable position. And when you're uncomfortable, you get outside of your elements of being calm, cool, and collective. You get a little frustrated. You get a little mad, those type things, if you make the wrong decision. But you made it. I didn't make you make it. I just put you in a position you had to make a decision. And sometimes that gets the temperatures temperatures going, the frustration going, and they just react to it in that way. I didn't push it. I just told them they got to make a decision. And sometimes people don't like making a decision. I saw a sign one time, and I think I did text it to you. It said, if you get in a fight in the garage where nobody can see you, I'm going to find you 500 bucks. Mm-hmm. But if you get in a fight on the start-finish line where everybody can see you, I'll give I'll give you 500 bucks. Yeah, yeah. You know, they think that, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of truth to that, some things. Uh, but, you know, I, the Bowman Gray's always been that way. I think, you know, uh, since I got involved with this thing, you know, being third generation, I think my biggest job is don't screw it up. Okay. Yeah. You know, don't screw it up. You know, the, this, a lot of the magic was there. It's just, you know, maybe we've heightened it a little bit. I don't know if we've heightened it a little bit, but the society has heightened it because of social media. Everything you do today, you're on camera. So, you know, that, that thing is more elevated because you're being seen by more people. You know, back in the days, um, you know, you're in his story, and you can go back and see the days of uh, Bobby Allison and Curtis Turner there having to the crash fest in the infield. Uh, and my grandfather, you know, the story is being the promoter that he was, is the next week he brought a shovel and a hatchet out there on the edge of the infield, and they dug a hole and buried the hatchet right there on the infield. So those things have been going on forever. It's just today it's heightened by society, cameras, YouTube, Social medias, you know, Twitters, all these things, X, whatever it is, all these things are heightened and everybody can see it now. I think that's the difference. There have obviously been a lot of rivalries mm-hmm. at the stadium for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, the Myers and, and Junior Miller and, and that kind of thing. Do you take a hands off approach to that? Or do you, you know. I don't. You know, there again, I put them in that position to make the decision. You know, I don't go by and say, you know, go wreck that guy. No, we don't want that because anybody can get hurt. That's the last thing we want. Um, I said, you know, y'all need to figure this out, you know. And I might walk by somebody's pits and just says, do you hear what he said about you? What did he say? Well, I can't say that. Just keep walking. Plant the seed, make them make a decision. You know, that's what you kind of do, those type of things. And that goes back to the, you know, making the, them make the decision. And it means a lot. These guys are heroes. They are heroes um, in this local community. I mean, you know, you can go in the stands and this section will be all orange or blue of Tim Brown. This one's all black of the Myerses. And not only in the modified division, but we have the rivalries, you know, in the sportsman division, the Amber Lynn versus the whole sportsman field. So, you know, uh, yeah. that, and, and 
I think that's something we capitalize on. We don't shy away from it, but we don't publicize it as to the top. But, you know, look at look at the world of society as we live in. You know, you got the Cowboys, the white hat and the black hat. OK, that's a rivalry. You got Rocky against all those Rocky one through twenty nines, whatever they are. <laughs> that's a rivalry. Yeah. You know, the society is built on the good guy and the bad guy. So you take that good guy and that bad guy, you kind of push them both towards the front. You don't shy away from it, but you don't push it. That's the main star because you got a lot more there going on. But society loves the underdog and the winner. And so we kind of capitalize it on a little bit. That may switch from week to week, the good guy and the bad guy, <laughs> depending on what happens. But, you know. You know, Bowman Gray has been a local institution for years. Mm-hmm. But back, I don't even know when the show ran, the, the Madhouse TV show. Mm-hmm. That, that puts you on a national level, and people were talking about coming to the to Winston Salem to see Bo McGray from all over all over the country. Yeah, how how did that show come about? That show came about. Um, there was a, a young man named Grant Keller, uh, and Grant was a film and art major at Wake Forest, and he went to summer school at Wake Forest. Well, you know, he's in Winston in Winston Salem in the summer. There's not a lot going on because Wake's not playing football, basketball, whatever going on. So him and his friends came to Bowman Gray, and when he came, they came over. You know, they said this is the 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 craziest place they've ever been in their life over at Bowman Gray because a lot going on, a lot of people, a lot of fans, a lot of moving parts there. The craziest thing there, he said, someday I'm going to do a show about this place. Well, he graduated from Wake Forest, and he came over, uh, him and his little buddies and uh, his little friends and. Uh, I shouldn't say little friends. His friends came <laughs> over, and they said, "Well, we'd like to, you know." document this this place and see what happens i said yeah you and everybody else you know leave me alone well he came back still persistent you know and he said well let's let us do a documentary you know a a trailer i guess they call it so i said okay just don't get killed in the pits you know that's the big thing don't get killed in the pits so anyway he did his little trailer and all that's good advice yeah it was (laughs) and and he listened that's the best part he listened he didn't get killed in the pits um he did it and it was really good you know, it was a really good trailer. He captured a lot of the uh, drama that was going on, the characters and those type of things. And then after the trailer, he said, well, I'm off to California to sell it. And we said, okay, good luck. Nice knowing you, you know. And he went out to my, the, the story he tells is he went out to California. Uh, he got hooked up with a company, um, Triage, I believe the name was the company, whatever, some marketing company. And they had a game plan. They were going to go to, at that time, there was a speed channel on TV, speed channel, ESPN, and for some reason, they had a connect. They they met somebody that had a cousin of a cousin of a cousin of a cousin that worked at History Channel. So they said, "Okay, you know, can you get us in the door?" So they were going to had this plan to hopefully to sell it to Speed Channel or one of those sports networks. Well, they went to the History Channel and the History Channel looked at the trailer and bought it right off. We're in. Well, wow. We're in. This is golden. We're in. They started filming the show and they came up to us and they said, "If we can do an eight hundred thousand." viewers we we got a hit we got a hit well the show was doing 1.2 a million 1.2 so they were very much exceeding their expectations timing is good and timing is bad uh th- th- it was good because it was showing but that was the same year that um history channel put all their marbles in in three shows american pickers pawn stars and madhouse well, you know, American Pickers and Pawn Pal- Stars just started going like gangbusters. So they kind of pushed Madhouse to the side because and put all their marbles in those two baskets. So it was a good show, great ratings. Uh, the notoriety was unbelievable. We had busloads of people coming from all over the country, Oklahoma, um, you know, all in the southeast and north. It were busloads. This was tour buses coming in with people. And everybody come in. I mean, they loved it. It was just, it was just a natural hit. They just loved it. You didn't have to be a race fan. You know, it was going back to the soap opera. Yeah. You know, it, and, but that's how it kind of take off, and it just kind of got pushed to the side. So, I know this is a loaded question. Okay, I got borrowed shoulders laid on. <laughs> <laughs> but what was your working relationship like with NASCAR over the years? When when you would have somebody showing out in the infield and running into each other, what what was your working relationship like? I think. Um, it, it was a lot of respect. They they got it. They understood what we did. They understood that we were entertainment. 
Um, I had many, 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 many calls the Tuesday morning. I think they had their their competition meetings on, on Tuesdays, you know, where they give out penalties and fines and those type stuff. And I would get the call from somebody on NASCAR Tuesday morning. We're getting ready to go to the meeting, you know. Mr. Helton and all the people up there in the competition, we're going to know what's going on. And they'll say, Gray, what are you doing? I said, I'm putting butts in the seats. What are y'all doing? You know, it was kind of, <laughs> kind of the answer. Yeah. And you're going to do something about it. Yeah, I'll do something about it. I'll take care. I'll take care of it. They they, they knew what we were. Um, did they embrace it every time? No, they didn't. But they kind of respected what we did uh, because it was good for the sport. I mean, it was, it was good for the sport because it was bringing notoriety to racing, to NASCAR racing. And I think any publicity you get in that's kind of good. And so it was, uh, it was a very respectful relationship, and it's still a respectful relationship, you know. That's kind of what brought this thing full circle back is um, when, we just, when we did this transaction, we met with, uh, you know, with Ben Kennedy, uh, Lisa France uh, Kennedy, and um, Jim France, and they all said, you know, let's don't screw this up. Let's don't screw this up. This is the big thing. It's important to us. Um, you know, it's the full circle. It goes back to their heritage with our family's heritage. So we bonded back together. And I think the word they put out is, is let's don't screw this up. This is important. Okay. <laughs> the clash out in L.A. Mm-hmm. at the Coliseum. Mm-hmm. Novel idea, right? Racing around the football field. <laughs> <laughs> Was there ever any discussion about having the clash at Bowman Gray? And if not, was there ever a point where you were like, hey, we're, we're here, we're right here, you don't have to build a multi-million dollar quarter mile? Was there any discussion of that? No, I, don't th- I think that's out of our uh, pay grade. I mean, our focus is weekly racing, and that's what we focus on. Um, you know, they have that whole organization that does the, the three t- – top tier divisions and that's what they do um you know there's and i think what um you may go back to the day when how this whole sure talk started sure this whole thing started uh, you know back in 21 i believe it was when they did their, their new car and then they had the clash coming up well they needed to introduce their new car well they were trying to accomplish a lot of things they wanted to introduce their new car and they want to introduce the clash in california because california is a major media market you know let's face it they they want that media out there california fontana shut down they don't have a presence in california they need that presence in california southern california and that's the way they accomplished that which made a lot of sense a lot of sense um it took it to an area that, that hasn't been in, in the la you know has racing nascar is not that big in that area but they got their footprint there that was important um they did the tire test and ben kennedy came out and of course ben kennedy um the grandson to the whole thing, he has a sentimental place because he won a race there. They we raced the yeah. the K and N races, and Ben finished second or third one week and come back and won a K and N race, one of his big marquee wins when he had his racing career. So it had a sentimental place to him. They came out and did the tire test, and me and Ben started started talking. You know, there's the Winston State University. Um, you got a lot of family ties here, and so we started talking and progressing. And those talks went on two and a half years because this is now, what, 24? And that was back in 21. That's three years. So um, we started talking. It just takes a while. You know, sometimes things yeah. move slow. But the clash was never on our radar, right? you know, because that's not what we do. We don't promote. We promote weekly racing. Us at me, myself, I promote weekly racing 18, 19 times, 17 times a year. That's my focus. They focus on those things. And I think uh, they're 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 very s- smart people, very smart people, and successful. If this if you don't believe it, look at it. They they they've been very good at what they do. What the future holds, I don't know. You know that's that's not my my thing. My thing's the weekly racing. And if they see an opportunity and it makes sense, they'll probably look at it. Um, we'll just see what happens on that one. Those initial discussions back in 21 at the tire test or wherever yeah. it was, um, who made the first pitch? Did you bring it up or did he? I did. Did I you did. really? Yeah, I did. We talked to him. We, you know, we're always, and, and I don't know if I was about a sale or I was trying to gain more 
publicity for Bobo Gray Stadium to promote weekly racing. Surely not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to figure. I'm trying to figure out any angle I can get, get the Bowman Gray name yeah. out there is yeah. good. You know, without sitting there saying, "Hey, Ben, look at us over here, at weekly track." You know, we're yeah. doing all these type things. You know, um, you know, can you help us do some things? You know, can you get us more involved with diversity with what's in the state? You know, uh, NASCAR has been very good at that. They have their whole program on that. You know, can you help us with sponsorships? Those type things and things kind of led one to another. Not necessarily, you know, do you want to take over Bum and Gray? But can we, is there some more things we can do together? I guess was the the angle I was going at. And then it kind of just led one to the other. So now you didn't actually own the track facility. You just owned the lease. Is that that's correct? We had Winston Salem Speedway Incorporated, which was founded, you know, by the uh, years ago. And we lit this facility is owned by Winston Salem, the city of. That's when it was back when the uh, um, Reynolds family gave the land to the city plus some seed money to get it started. So the city owns it. Uh, we lease it. We've got a, you know, I still say we, I still, I'm still feel like I'm part of it. Uh, you know, the lease runs through 20, 50, 30 years. And then Winston Salem State has a long term lease to play football there. So it's a very unique situation for the city. I mean, most uh, municipalities would, you know, just thrive to have two major tenants in a, in a, a facility like that. And they're blessed that way. Very good with that. Do you know what kind of plans NASCAR has for the, facility not to ruin the magic you know that's the that's the that's the thing right now don't screw it up that's what i've been told right now is don't screw it up and that's that's what our focus is is don't screw it up plans i don't know you know like i say they're they're smart people they they i'm sure they're thinking years down the road um what they want to plan but our focus is weekly racing right now are you going to have any kind of role in the place yeah, I in, hope in the so. Future. I hope so. I'm not really ready to retire yet. I mean, I've had a lot of job offers already, you know. Have you really? Yeah, I've had probably about four, maybe five job offers already. You know, I said, no, 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 I'm going to, you know, I'm going to hang around here till they run me off. And uh, But right now we will be back this next year, and I, I think we'll be there for several more years to come because it's a big animal. It's a lot of undertaking. Um, you know, I I think there'll be some changes minor changes because they're a big operation the way they operate. I think the, uh, the the hardcore nucleus will stay the same. And I hope I'm part of it. I'm planning on being part of it. I'm definitely part of it this year, and I, I'm not ready to retire yet. I think a lot of people's worst fears is the madhouse becoming a kinder, gentler, more genteel place. Do you see any danger of that? Uh, I hope not. You know, that's not keeping the magic, you know, like we've been told. Uh, Stir that pot. Well, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know. I know. It, it, it's, it's, I think they, there will be, I think it, NASCAR will have every intention keeping everything the same that they can. Okay. There will be some things that they can't keep the same because they have a bigger target on their back. Okay. And what I mean by that is, is they may be, their tolerance level won't be as wide as mine is because they have a lot of eyeballs on them. I think they will take it to the limit of what they can bear and what they can do. Uh, there will be some changes, but I don't see them coming in and says, you know, you touch somebody, you're out, those type things. I don't see that. I think they will come in and just do more things um, on the broad scale that they need to do. Uh, but, you know, they want to keep the magic. I think they really do. So. How do you plan to spend your summer? Bum and gray. <laughs> right now, we're already we're already hard at it. I mean, you know, yeah. it is, is, the thing of it is, is, I mean, you know, people say now that, you know, how are you going to spend your summer or, or you know, um, it's kind of like, they think we're like a preacher. The preachers only work Sundays, right? Right. They just work Sundays. They yeah. do a one hour, uh, one hour, you know, preach for one hour and they go home. They don't do nothing the rest of the week. And they think if we just show up on a Saturday and we, you know, run races for four hours, whatever it is, then we go home, we don't do nothing the rest of the week. It's not that way. There's not a day that doesn't go by year round. Year round, there's not a day that goes by that we do not address some issue with Bowman Gray. Whether it's a competitor calling about this, whether it's a sponsor calling about that, whether it's insurance, it's whatever. It's, it's a year round job. Now, I'm not saying eight hours a day, but you do something every day of the year with racing. And this year, we're, we're practicing this Saturday. 
you know, we got practice this Saturday, and then we're hitting the ground every Saturday from here to September. We're doing something. We're doing something. Well, every day of the week we're doing something. So uh, we'll be right there in it. We're still uh, actively involved with ticketing, uh, tickets, ticket sellers, rules, regulations. You know, we, we're, we're, we're right at it. They brought a nice young man in um, to kind of pick the pieces up to, to, to learn um, he's got a big learning curve because it's, there's a lot going on in different things. One one thing that's made Bowman Gray successful is um, I do I make the cars go in a circle, which is a, you know that's what I do. Uh, <clears throat> I've got a cousin Lauren Penless, and he does the PR, the you know the publicist. He also prints our program we have. Then I have Uncle Dale Penless, and Dale does the sponsorships and hospitality, and. We all stay in our lane and do what we do, and we all, I think, are really, really good at what we do. Now, we talk and we converse back and forth daily about what's going on, what's happening, because one thing ties into the other. They all tie together, but we stay in our lanes, and we focus on what we do to make that the very best we can do. And I think this is going to be hard for one person to come in, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, fifteen 10, 15 people to come in and do what we do, but... Um, I mean, it'll take a while, and you know, like I say, I, I'm not planning on going anywhere now. NASCAR tells me to go home. We'll just go up the road somewhere and do something, so we'll see. Last question. When something arises this summer, mm-hmm. you say you got big shoulders. Mm-hmm. When that when that issue arises, whose shoulders is that issue going to fall on, yours or the general manager's or somebody else? I think it's going to be both. Okay. I think it's going to be both of us, and uh, and I told um, – Austin, the young man coming in, uh, I says, you know, because when they come in, they're going to play us against each other because something's not going to go their way, and they're going to run up to you and say, Gray said this, you know, and then they're going to run up to me and say, well, Austin said this. Well, I told Austin, I says, just say, okay, let's just go find Gray and let's see what he said, and I'm going to do the same with you. I'm going to say, Austin, let's just, you know, let's go find Austin and see yeah. what he said. It's one of those type of things um, when people get mad and they're upset and um, really, really, really – upset there's no need to talk to them right then you're not going to get anywhere just walk away let's cool off calm down and then we'll come back and convene later and talk about it and that'll that'll be kind of the same format we'll do with austin and things going this forward we'll make a decision as a team okay i'm not looking at austin coming in and taking over and being the general manager austin's just now part of the bowman gray family so we still have the family intact and what I mean by family is officials, everybody that's there, drivers, track crew, whatever. It's all the family. Austin's coming into the family now, and we're just going to be at the pointy end of the stick as a family, but we'll still make decisions as a team. That's the plan. All right. This is the last, last question. No, I got all day. I got broad shoulders. What does Bowman Gray Stadium mean to Gray Garris? Uh, for the last 50 years, it's been my baby. It's been my life. You know, it's what we do. That's what you have grown up doing. That's what you have groomed. That's what you have. Uh, it's my family. I said, you know, it's the Bowman Gray family. You know, I remember Burt Myers coming there, and Burt was so small when his dad came through the pits. Burt would walk on the other side of the car to try to sneak into the pits. I mean, he didn't have to duck down. He was that small. <laughs> I mean, he yeah. didn't even come up above the yeah. wheels. Yeah. You know, those peoples, we grew up with those peoples. I mean, you know, and now Bert's son's racing. So, you know, it's fourth generation, you know. So it's the family, uh, and, you know, and the families, we feud, we fight like your outside of racing family does. And the inside family, racing family fights or not fights, but have disagreements, you know. So, I mean, you know, it's, sometimes it's it's – you realize you've got to move on. I mean, you know, it just who would imagine not that I'm at the level of any of these other people, but, you know, just like Coach K realized, you know, it's time, you know, um, you know, Roy Williams at Carolina, it's time, you know, and it's um, it's that time. We don't have a real good succession plan and I don't have to worry about it now. I still want to be involved. I'm still involved. So I think it's going to be a good deal. I really, really do. You know, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the you know future. I think um, NASCAR has so many more resources than we can do. You know, the biggest challenges we've got in this world today of racing is, you know, electric cars, driverless cars. You know, what's going to happen down that avenue? And the younger generation is going to have to pick it up because I, I don't know how to do that. I don't. And that and the next people figure, I can give my two cents, which probably won't be worth nothing. But that's the future. You know, good future, bad future is the future. So we'll be good. It's going to be good.